Hello and good morning. How are you doing today? I'm great. How are you? Absolutely fantastic and very excited to talk with you because you embrace animals and one th- that that is such my life and and I just I love the way that you're able to write about them to share stories to bring things together it, it's your, your heart is in the right place thank you thank you thank you yeah I have I have loved writing these animal stories it's been really great to sort of sink into an ecosystem and go okay if I would what would I what would I notice if I was an animal what would I be smelling what would I be hearing what would I be paying attention to Right, because it's not always what I'm paying attention to as a human. That's for sure. So, um, yeah, it's, it's been great fun to write. See, I understand that vision because I will do the same thing when it comes to you know being out here in this forest that I live in with a copperhead snake. What is that copperhead snake doing? Why this place? What what's going on? And so I do. I become them, and I don't know if that's because of the martial artist in me, but I want to be them to see what the human is doing to them. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, and just and I love it too when my animal characters come across a thing they've never encountered before. Yep. And and asking myself, what do what would they think that thing is? Because everybody understands a new thing in relation to the things that they already know. And so yeah, that's a really fun connection to make and and um and helping kids make those leaps of inference too. You know, because my readers are pretty young, so that's they're at the beginning of that game, and that's all exciting. Yeah. I mean, I'm glad you said that, that your readers are young, because while while I was reading the book, I really said to my wife, I wish my third grade teacher, Mrs. Stephenson, was here so that she could read this book to me, because I, it's, it's, that's that kind of a story. Hmm. Yeah, I really love read aloud ability. I read my work out loud all the time. Um, first of all, I will never see the mistakes that I've made. I, I'm much better at hearing the mistakes than seeing it. And, um, but, um, but I really want that to be a satisfying reading out loud experience because just because a book is good doesn't mean it really works out loud. But that, that reading time in a classroom and in a family, it's precious. Mm-hmm. I think the, over the years being read to in school, that is, all told from kindergarten through the end of sixth grade that's about 500 hours and it is the best writing instruction i have ever received Hmm. truly that that reading aloud in grade school the book we're talking about is a horse named sky how did this book come to you and how did you maintain the discipline in order to bring this book all the way to its final page well i was you know my entire ambition as a third grader was to become a pony express rider myself nice you know I mean, outside all day, going fast, excellent pay, very little supervision, what's not to like, right? And so um, so when I dug into the Pony Express a little bit more, at the beginning of my research process, I learned that the Pony Express, for the flat sections of the, of the Pony Express Trail in the east, they just took racehorses out of Tennessee and Kentucky. But um, those horses just couldn't hack the mountains at all. Mm. But Mustangs are so tough, man. They're just, they're cold hardy. They can, they can run at altitude. They are so fast. Their hooves are really healthy and strong, so they don't need to be shod. And, um, and they're smart. They're yeah. just really smart about um, the hazards that are actually there. And so they were a natural choice for the Pony Express. So they took Mustangs off the range to run across the Rockies and over the Sierra Nevada. When, when you talk about the Mustangs, I mean, I'm from Montana, and the, the prior mountains were where the wild Mustangs were. Did you visit that area? How did you get so close to the Mustangs? Well, I wasn't able to go to the prior range, but I did in eastern Oregon on the Steens Mountain Wilderness. There have been wild horses there for hundreds of years, actually. Wow. and. Um, uh, it's amazing, and it's very remote. I mean, where I was looking at horses, we were like 50 or 60 miles from a gas station. <laughs> so it's a very empty country out there. And um, But the great thing is that there's plenty of room for wild horses mm-hmm. out there. Um, and so I, I had an opportunity to see them. It was during the pandemic, so I was camping in my little research van. <laughs> and I just remember the sun coming up. And we had uh, camped not far from a water hole. And so, you know, that beautiful rising sun and then these bands of horses, they just, they just appeared <laughs> out of the mist of the morning coming down to the water to drink. And 
they're very deferential to each other, you know, they don't really want conflict. And so each, each horse, um, each band comes as a group in turn and they wait for each other. It was amazing to see. I study Native American spirituality, and which means I study all animals, and I had to do some research on horses, and they represent an unexpected adventure in time to free yourself physically as well as emotionally, and that's what you just said. You, you said as they came in there as one big family, they left as the family as well. They love each other, and they love to be free. Yeah. Yeah, their bonds to each other uh, are really um, are really beautiful to see, and and... I like I remember seeing a, a stallion with his group of mares and then there was a bachelor band of uh, young stallions nearby and they were starting to, you know, talk trash to each other. Then they did a little kicking the dirt. But as soon as one of them reared up and started punching at another horse, mm. that big stallion, was he just fixed those young horses with a stare. He didn't even say anything. <laughs> and you would... <laughs> I've been caught smoking behind the gym. <laughs> like, what? Fight us? No, we're all just grazing here. It was done in a heartbeat. It was amazing to see that kind of um, communication and connectedness and respect. It was, yeah, it was very um, not what I was expecting at all. Wow. Um, but, yeah, they're very, um, they're such expressive animals, horses. It's, it was fascinating to watch them. I experienced that with the deer that live in this forest. We have about nine deer, and, and when, when the bucks come walking in, I love to sit there and just stare at them and to watch their, their body movement. So for you to experience these horses, I just can't imagine what it was doing to your heart because it, it's, it's almost like they're communicating to us as well. Yeah. Yeah, and they're, they're inspiring, and they're so beautiful. And can you even imagine our history without horses? Oh, no. Where would we be? Mm-mm. Nope, nope. <laughs> Mm-mm. So, um, yeah, I feel like we owe them some uh, some time and space on the range there. I keep waiting for CBS to approach you to take your stories of animals and give it give you a Sunday morning show. Because, I mean, the way that you share these stories is the way we learn to better understand the animals. It's not so scientific. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I had I've had some interesting conversations with. Um, biologists talking mm-hmm. about that very question about what is it, what can we know about animals? And and there are good reasons not to personify animals when you're doing research on them. But many of these researchers have also said, although personifying animals has its risks, denying animals um, intellect and emotion that we would and motivation that we would prefer to reserve for ourselves mm. is equally problematic, right? And so, um, so I try and and give them that full range of of social um, development there when I'm writing about them. Now you've written about whales. You've written about the wolf, which mm-hmm. which uh, I just love the wolf. What what what's in your future plans? Well, the next book up is going to be called A Wolf Called Fire, right. and it is about one brother. I've gotten so many lovely letters from children who are like, what about Wander's brother? <laughs> he loved his <laughs> <laughs> And so I got to thinking, we've learned some, some things about how the leadership of wolf packs goes, right? Wolf, wolves are very dynamic animals, and... And the leadership of a pack changes over pretty regularly. But there isn't one way to be the leader of a pack. There isn't only one leadership style. And so this book gave me an opportunity to show how a wolf who isn't the biggest or the fastest wolf in the pack, how he finds his own way to becoming a leader when he's left behind with, um, with the pups of his, his home pack. I love the idea that you've got such a connection with your readers that you allow them to reach out to you. Yeah, I love the letters I get from kids. It's pretty inspiring. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because in, in reality, I mean, you could be that author that gets them to pick up a writing instrument to share their own stories. We all have art authors that really gave us that inspiration. Yeah. Well, and something that I tell kids all the time, too, is that in 1973, when I'm about the age of my reader now, 
The United States passed the Wild and Free Roaming Horses and Burrows Protection Act, which makes it illegal to hunt horses. It makes it illegal to sell their bodies for dog food and, and provides them a number of protections under law. That law did not have any constituency advocating for it except for children. Mm-hmm. Wild Horse Annie wrote a bunch of, uh, you know, op-ed things in a newspaper, but she only ever heard from children. So she went around from school to school and talked to children, and thousands and thousands of children wrote to their members of Congress, their governors, the Department of the Interior, saying wild horses deserve our protection. And so it is the only law that I know of that was passed almost entirely on the advocacy of children. And so something that I always tell children when I talk to them is writing is the most power you can have, mm. right? It's more power. It's going to be a while before they vote, but there is power in writing, and the writing of children changed the laws of this country, and that, I think, is really important. Wow. I want them to have that power. I want them to use it wisely, and, and so um, whether they become authors or not, everybody needs to write, <laughs> and for most people, what they write down is the most power they will have in their life. So true. Where can people go to find out more about you, to find out about all your books, and really to tap into your energy so they can give you some love? <laughs> awesome. I have a website. It's roseanneperry.com. Um, I'm on Instagram sometimes, um, and um, also just roseanne.perry. And, um, and, also, children write to me at Annie Bloom's bookstore as well, which is where I work. It's my neighborhood independent bookstore. And so um, if they want to send me an actual paper letter, that's a good way to go. I Annie Bloom's it. bookstore. Oregon. I love it. Please come back to the show anytime in the future, Roseanne. The door is always going to be open for you. Thank you. Will you be brilliant today, okay? <laughs> Thank you so much, Earl. You take care.